right? So, so usually what you do is you need some approximation of the Jacobian at your initial starting point, right? So your two options are, well, either you just compute the darn thing once, and then at least you don't have to keep recomputing it, right? That would be a very good J0. Or, if you're lazy, you can make a very common choice and just choose J0 to be the identity matrix, and it turns out that this strategy still converges as long as you start close enough to, uh, to the root. Similarly, this is an approximation, right? So let's say that I'm using Newton's method and I'm like bouncing all over the set of possible exits, right? Which can happen. I can take really big steps in Newton's method, which is good sometimes, right? Because I can kind of zip to the, 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 the root of the equation, but if we're thinking of our sequence as sort of approximations of the Jacobian, then I take a huge step that's like kind of no longer true, right? Because really derivatives happen when you take small steps. Right? That's, that's when we define derivative, it's all about limits as things go to zero. And in particular, this iterative update of j sub k has a really long memory. Meaning that I build in all of these sequence into my jk and I just keep updating it, but I never actually remove my old sequence as I've moved far away from my initial guess. Right? This can be a problem, because I can have a really bad Jacobian. In fact, sometimes it's better to just occasionally throw out my Jacobian, replace it with I, and keep going, because I've kept a long memory and that's not so good. Uh, so this is a, a, a series of, uh, of algorithms called limited memory methods. We'll see this in optimization, too. And basically what they say is that we really don't want to update JK more than like 10 times, say. So after that, we can either reset him back to the identity matrix, or, what we could do is keep track of the last 10 iterates and reconstruct J sub K as if he had started 10 iterations ago at the identity. This makes sense? It's kind of a clever trick. Right? In other words, this little formula for updating J from step to step to step, yeah, uh, what, I could, what I could have done is gone back and said, well, let's say just accidentally I'd actually started three iterations ago, wherever that was. Right? And then I could just do three iterations worth of Newton starting at that point, and only do three updates. And I already have that information around, right? Because I was bouncing the same places when I when I did, uh, you know, Burton's method. But somehow then you limit the amount of memory you have. Uh, by the way, when I say limited memory here, I don't mean memory like RAM. I mean memory like how many iterations ago you remember. Chances are you're not going to run out of RAM unless you have a really funky optimization problem. Cool. Finally, uh, I, I had two complaints, but I only solved one, right? One of my complaints was the differentiation is hard, and the other was, uh, I forgot. Oh, that, that, we have to, that we have to invert our, our matrix at every step. <laughs> so I told the burdens when it gets rid of having to take derivatives, right? We replace derivatives with secants, but we still have to invert this weird J sub K matrix. And here's like, to me, this really deep, smart idea that somebody thought of. So let's look back at the Broden step. And once again, uh, uh, like Tuff points out, there really should be jk plus 1 over there. I apologize. Yet another time. My bad. But anyway, this formula looks a little complicated, right? It takes j sub k, and it, and it adds some weird outer product to it. But in fact, really all that matters is that it takes this form, right? That it's jk minus 1 plus some vector times some other vector transpose, right? And somehow, the set of n by n matrices is way bigger than the set of matrices that can be written in this form right? as an outer product of just one vector and one other vector. In fact, this thing can have no more than rank what? Two, one? It's like a very, it's a very uninteresting matrix in a lot of them. It's a simple update to change it. So, I know we don't like theoretical linear algebra, but there is one crowning result of theoretical linear algebra, which I'm going to leave on your homework. And the basic idea here is that if I take a matrix A and I add an outer product of two vectors to it, I can actually write down the inverse of this new updated thing in terms of the inverse of A. This is a super cool formula. It's called the Sherman-Morrison formula, and it shows up every which way in optimization. Yeah, technically it's, it's linear algebra, but in fact this is a very practical formula that, that I use in my everyday life. And you probably do too on your cell phone, but you don't know it. So, anyway, it's going to be on your homework if you haven't checked this result. It's not hard to check. But sorry. Not, not really sorry, but, 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 but it's such a slide. Uh, it's very easy to check, right? You just, if you ever want to check that a matrix is an inverse of another matrix, all you have to do is multiply them and see that you get the identity. Yeah? Um, never mind how, how Sherman and Morrison might have actually thought of this thing, which is a completely separate issue. I probably won't walk you through that. Cool? All right. So 
So what does this suggest about how I can change Broyden's method a little bit and make it a lot more practical if I don't want to keep inverting matrices J? Remember I told you that we should never invert, we should never write down the inverse of a matrix explicitly? This is the one, well one of about three times in this class where this is not true. And the reason is this. What I could do is I could choose J0 to be, for example, the identity. Right? And then I know J0 inverse, right? They have the inverse of the identity, the identity. And now what I'm going to do is rather than updating J, I'm going to update J inverse using this, uh, this Sherman Morrison formula. Right? Because, and basically what it says is I started with the matrix I knew how to invert, and then I didn't change that matrix a whole lot when I went to the next step. And in fact, I could update the inverse of the matrix just as easily as I could update the matrix itself. Right? This is super cool, because what it means is that you don't have to invert a darn thing while you're running Gordon's method, right? As long as you start with the matrix J0 that's, uh, that's invertible and for which you know the inverse, then from there forward, you just update the inverse of J rather than J itself, right? We have a formula for it. So in fact, Broden's method is very efficient. All it is is matrix multiplies additions and evaluating F. This is surprising and very, very smart. Whoever thought of this? You know, this is not something I would have thought of. Okay. So this pretty much concludes our discussion of root finding. Thankfully, root finding actually doesn't come up all that often in practice except in a single variable. Uh, but there is one additional tool which is also useful for optimization that I thought I might mention, and that is something called automatic differentiation. Oh, oops, before I get there. Uh, similar to our, our limited memory strategy for updating J sub K, you notice that this thing is still kind of looks like, uh, you, you know, it takes the initial A and then there's just some update formula to get all the other A's, so you could just as easily do limited memory there. Okay. All of these J's of K's are just approximate Jacobians, and if I'm taking big steps, or if F is very wiggly and complicated, then the Jacobian might be a bad approximation, right? And then Newton's method is likely to fail, right? Newton's method works well when you know the Jacobian and when your function is sort of nice and smooth and, and well-behaved. But sometimes that's not the case, and you really do, at the very least, need the actual honest-to-goodness Jacobian of F, uh, even, even if you, you're still kind of walking around in parameter space to find the root, yeah? Luckily, there is one tool uh, that, that can help you with that. It's called automatic differentiation. This is becoming a very popular thing, so I decided to add it to 205, just to mention it at least. The idea is this. Let's say that x and y are functions of t. Okay. And, and maybe not only do I know some value of x, but I also know dx dt in the same place. Right? These are just two numbers. Yeah? These are two variables, and I know the derivative of those variables at, at that point. Then how do I get the derivative of the product, for example? Well, you know, the value of the product is just the, the product of these two values. And the value of the derivative of the product, well, I can just apply the product rule. Yeah? But if you look, this is just some formula in terms of the derivatives I already knew. Right? So what automatic differentiation does is it's actually a really clever um, application of operator overloading in C++, for example where you make a new data type that carries around not only a value of a variable, but also its derivative with respect to all the parameters you care about. And then what happens is like, for example, every time I add two numbers behind the scenes, I also add the two derivatives. Every time I multiply two numbers behind the scenes, I also apply the product rule, right? And so at any point in time, I can ask my auto diffed variables, not only for their value, but also the derivative with respect to t, and it can tell me both. This is a really clever strategy. Right? And, and the nice thing is it's transparent to your programmer. Now if I use automatic differentiation, have I made any type of secant approximation or anything else? No. I actually get the exact derivative of my variables uh, with respect to the parameters. Very clever trick. What's the drawback of automatic is that it's slow. Uh, yes, Leonard. So would you be computing Newton's method straight? Yeah. With all these, this funny addition multiplication? Exactly. So, so basically, what you'll end up with um, is, uh, let's, let's, we can do a quick example. So let's say that I'm a, uh, let's say that uh, we have f of x comma y is equal to x cosine of uh, x y. That's a com sufficiently complicated function, right? Then, uh, right, so now my variables are really going to be, and let's say that I want, uh, you know, the, 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 the Jacobian 
in fact, uh, this is, there's one variable, so the, the gradient of f at 1, 1. Cool? So here, we're going to make variables that look like this. So x is now, so x, in fact, let's put 2 so we can distinguish it. Yeah. So uh, the, uh, the value of x is 1. And the derivative of the function x, or at least the gradient of the function x, is equal to 1, 0. Yeah. And similarly, the variable y is equal to 2, and the derivative of y is 0, 1. Right? Assuming that this is the x lot, this is the y lot. So if I were to write code for this, what would I do? Well, first, I would compute x, y. Right? And how could I do that? Well, the value is easy to do. Right? Maybe. It's uh, 1 times 2. <laughs> and then what would I do to get the gradient? Well, I would have this times this. Right, so 2, 0, plus this times this, which is 1. Yeah. See what I did? Now I have the uh, gradient of this thing with respect to x and y. Uh, and so on. I won't even try it with cosine. That was a poor decision on my part. Uh, <laughs> but you see what's going to happen in autodiff, right? So basically, behind the scenes, it's going to give you the value, and it's also going to play with the gradients all at the same time. No? It's a really smart strategy, because it gives you the exact Jacobian, even if like writing out the formula is really hairy. You know? It's a very clever trick, and one that people are, is becoming very popular in optimization. Especially, for example, if I'm writing like stock market code that only needs to run once and tell me like what stock to buy and then I'm never going to use it again, then there's no reason for me to like spend six days writing down derivatives so that I can optimize, because Autodiff will just do it, and yeah, my code will run a little bit slower, but like, who cares, because I still got the optimum value and then I was done. So automatic differentiation is a ridiculously cool tool, and I encourage you guys to all try and implement this at home, uh, just in, in C++, because it's actually very illustrative of, of uh, like a very clever trick. And this plus Newton's method is like 10 lines of code, right? It's super cool. Okay. And that ends our discussion of group finding. Do we have any questions about that before I move on to something uh, not at all different? Go oh, once, go twice. Cool. Yes. Apparently my laptop does have a fire this week. Okay. Alright. So now we're going to change uh, gears ever so slightly. Right, so basically we're, we're, we keep cranking it up just a little bit, and now we're going to crank up slightly more to a sort of from, from an algebra problem to a calculus problem, where we'd like to minimize the function. Right? This is called optimization, and it is a humongous, humongous, humongous field of numerical analysis, and one that we will just barely scratch the top of, right? But if you go to the, uh, the CME department at Stanford, there are like seven or eight professors whose full-time job it is to write down algorithms that do what we're going to cover in about a day and a half. So, so it, it is worth noting that, that what, we, what we talk about in 205 is going to be by no means a complete story, but hopefully that will give you some idea of the options that are out there, and uh, enough that you can, A, have some tool you can try out of the box for, for optimization, even if it's a little bit slow, and some idea of where to look for, for more advanced methods. And if you're interested in this kind of stuff, come talk to me, because this is my bread and butter. Okay. So, in CS205, we, we, right, I keep coming back to this word, this variational approach, right? The idea here is that every time we want to do some calculation and we don't know exactly how, we write down an energy function that, that, that sort of measures the desirable properties of what we're trying to do, and then we minimize it, right? And so far, in this class, we've gotten really lucky, right? In fact, I, I've chosen these minimization problems in a very strategic way that we can write down just like a formula for what the minimum is. For example, when we did Broyden's algorithm, right, we wrote down this, uh, this minimization, right? And rather than needing to, to write down algorithms that just generically minimize stuff, by doing a little bit of Lagrange multiplier work, we were able to just come up with a formula, which I erased, uh, to tell us what delta J is in closed form. Sometimes you don't get so lucky, right? Sometimes you know, you can write down the Lagrange multipliers and it's totally obtuse what the heck that tells you about life, and you still want to minimize the function. This happens a lot. We'll, we'll see a couple examples. But I do think it's worth reminding you guys that the, the, this approach of, of minimizing an energy function is by no means uncommon. Right? In fact, in this class, I was able to count at least six instances where we've already done this in the first four weeks. Right? Everything from least squares to projection, eigenvectors, inverses, even strategically, look, the Brighton stuff that we just talked about in the first half of class. Yeah? 
By the way, we also sometimes have to add constraints to our optimization. So far, our constraints have basically either been linear or sort of eigen-looking constraints, but sometimes those can be really complicated too. So for today, we're not going to worry about constraints. We'll introduce those on uh, Wednesday, I guess. But we're just going to worry about minimizing a function. And let's see uh, why we care about this. So again, we have this sort of variational approach where this is just a general approach to problem solving. In fact, it's really an interesting sort of algorithmic strategy, and one that's very popular in uh, learning, graphics, and other fields that use like doubles instead of ints, right? Where I'm going to define an energy, measuring all the desirable things that I care about, and then just try to minimize this thing. In fact, in variational calculus, what you do is you try and characterize what has to happen at the minimum, but we're not going to deal with that, unless I feel like putting that in one. Okay. So what is our motivation? Well, so far, we wrote down these first-order optimality conditions, right? We wrote down our KKT, or our uh, Lagrange multipliers, and we just were able to solve exactly, right? Just write down some formula for what has to happen at the minimum. But sometimes we just don't get so lucky, right? So today we're going to talk about this, this second case, when we still have a function we want to minimize, but, and we, we try writing down the Lagrange multipliers because we're good numerical analysts and we do our homework, but at the end, what comes out isn't anything usable and we still like to minimize this function. Right? This happens a lot. And let's see some examples. So today, we're going to worry about just minimizing f of x with respect to x without any constraints on x. Right? This is a very classical problem, by the way. I mean, you, 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 you've certainly done this in single variable calculus and probably multivariable as well. Yeah. So, for example, we already talked about least squares. I think we've talked about it to death now. Right? And one of our motivations for least squares was regression. Remember this, where we wrote down a form of a function and we had some sort of coefficients that we're trying to compute when we did regression? Well, let's say that I want to write uh, f of x as c e to the ax. Right? Pretty common form for a function. I want to model something exponentially, but I don't know c and I don't know a. Right? But I have a bunch of x, y pairs of what I think happens. One thing I could do is say, well, I really want y equals c e to the ax, right? So, but and I have all these different x, y pairs, more than two, so I can't hope uh, to recover c and a exactly, right? So, well, us being variational calculus <coughs> experts, we're going to write down an energy in terms of our unknowns. What are our unknowns here? They're the, 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 the parameters of the exponential function we're trying to figure out, right, a and c. And what is it going to be? Well, we can just sum over all of our data points. You've seen this pattern a few times, right? Sum over all the data points, and you just say, well, how well is y, uh, how well is y approximated by c e to the ax? Well, I plug in x, I plug in y. I subtract the two, square, so that it's positive, and sum them all up. Yeah? This is just some, some measure of how good our choice of a and c are with respect to the data points we have. Did everybody see the game that I just played there? That's not, that's not too hard of a game. Yeah. So what is my goal here? My goal is to minimize this function e of a comma c with respect to both a and c, but there's a problem, which is that a lives on top of an exponent. Right? And try as we might, we can write down all of the optimality conditions we want, and we're never going to get that a out of the exponent. So all of our linear strategies fail here. But that doesn't mean we can't still minimize this function, it just means that we can't minimize it using the, the routines we've developed so far. Yeah? Another example uh, comes from machine learning. Uh, how many people have seen this phrase before? Maximum likelihood estimation, MLE. Wow. Huh, learning is popular these days. Cool. But in case you haven't, that's OK. So let's say I have a classroom full of students, and each of them has a different height. Mine is small. Other people have big heights. Uh, Dave has a big height. And they, 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 you know, at the end, if we draw enough people from this, we might assume that our, our, our distribution of heights of students is approximately Gaussian, right? Meaning that it has sort of this bell curve shape. Right? So that is, uh, obviously, this is a slightly wrong model because we can't have negative heights, but I'm not going to worry about that here. In fact, the central limit theorem tells me that I'm sort of okay anyway. And, uh, right, so the average student height is the, the peak of the Gaussian, and the standard deviation of this thing we're going to call sigma. Yeah. So hopefully this amount of the story is uh, somewhat familiar. Right, so what is the likelihood that I have a given height h? Well, one thing I can do is just plug it into this, uh, this bell curve here. Right? So let's say you know, I'm, I'm certainly below the mean, for, for, for guys at least, so I put in h. And this number here is the probability 
uh, of the, sort of the, the likelihood that I have this height if I'm just drawing randomly out of a class. Right? So obviously I have the highest likelihood if I have the average height and it sort of drops off as I move away. Right? Now chances are, my height and Leonard's height and Martina's height are all kind of independently drawn from this distribution of heights, right? There's, there's very little dependence between uh, my height and Leonard's height, unless for some reason this is a class for tall people, which uh, I hope it isn't. Um, yeah, so I, if I make an independent sample, then let's say that I measure all the heights of all the students in my class, Right? So this is h1 all the way through hn, then the likelihood of all of those heights happening simultaneously is just the product of the probabilities of each of those heights one at a time. Oh, this is a sort of elementary probability, or if you don't, if the story isn't familiar to you, to, it's okay, just believe me. This, obviously this part is uh, not the 205a part of this problem. Now one reasonable question that I could answer would be this. Maybe I flip this problem on its head a little bit. And I say, okay, well, I have a list, for whatever reason, I'm a, you know, maybe I'm kind of a perverse instructor, and I have a list of all the heights of all the students in my class, right? And so this is just some set, you know, some set of data points that lives downstairs, right? They're probably kind of concentrated around Mu, and then a couple over here, you know, there's Dave, uh, here's Justin, and, 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 and they're just, a, you know, a bunch of things on the number line. Of course, my heights. But what, what don't I know here are the parameters of my distribution. Right? In particular, I don't know mu, and I don't know sigma. Now, in this particular case, it turns out it's not too hard to write down formulas. But the basic idea here right, is that, remember, the likelihood of me having drawn all the heights in my class, given mu and sigma, is this product here. But I can flip it on its head and say, OK, I know all the heights of the student in my class. And I want to find the mu and the sigma that maximizes the likelihood that I could have drawn those n numbers. Does that make sense? And this is called the maximum likely estimate of the likelihood estimate of the parameters of the distribution. This is a very, very, very common problem in machine learning. Arguably, like a good like 50% of machine learning boils down to some type of n. Even if they don't say so, it does. You can trust me. As somebody that doesn't do machine learning. Um, well, according to my job application. Uh, right, so, uh, <laughs> just kidding, anybody's watching. Um, okay, so what can I do? Well, again, I want to estimate mu and sigma, and how am I going to do that? Well, I'm going to take the maximum of this function, not with respect to the h's, right, those are known, those are the heights of the students in my class, but with respect to the parameters of the distribution, and this is called the maximum likelihood estimate. Yeah? And this is a very common strategy for estimating how probability distributions work. Well, here's the thing. So in this particular case, it turns out that you can write down a formula for mu and sigma. It's probably clear what that probably is. But in some cases, right, I could have written down some really funky probability distribution p. For example, maybe I incorporate the fact that I know that people don't have negative heights, and now I have to put in, I forget the proper distribution, what Laplace, Lagrange, whatever. Um, and in that case, maybe I don't know a closed form formula for p anymore. But I still want to estimate this thing. Well, this is just a minimization problem. Or actually, it's a maximization problem. Or you can minimize minus that if you want. Um, yeah, and this is something that shows in machine learning all the time. In fact, it gets even more complicated if it turns out that these H's, for example, if you take CS228, you learn about a Bayes network, and you have one little parameter sitting in every single node of a graph, and you have to maximize this thing over the entire graph, this can become a very complicated problem very quickly. But the things that we're talking about today are exactly what they use as sort of their initial strategy for this. After that, they use fancy stuff, right? like Hagrad and all this stuff. I might have you do one on your homework if I can figure out a way to describe it without a bunch of probability, because that's not fair to people who haven't taken 229. Anyway, now we're doing completely different. So I gave you guys lots and lots and lots, and on your midterm, there are probably going to be even more quadratic-looking energies that you're going to want to minimize. But sometimes energies just aren't quadratic. right? So one example of that is the MLE energy we just saw. Another would be a geometric problem. So for example, let's say that I have a bunch of points in the plane. Right? In fact, I'll even draw them for you because the, the whiteboard is planar. Isn't that convenient? So here, here are all my data points. Here's uh, x1, here's x2, here's x3, here's x4, here's um, x5. Okay. Now, a problem that shows up in uh, C 
statistics and also in the type of geometry that I do, is I could choose some point in the plane, and I could just compute his distance to each of the other points. And sum all those distances up. Right? And one question I could ask is what point on the entire plane minimizes the sum of distances? Right? Notice that this is not a least squares problem. I didn't say the sum of distances squared, I said the sum of distances. Well, all of a sudden, we're hopeless. We don't know how to solve this problem. We can know, and all of our machinery for 205 breaks down. We don't have any idea how to do this when there's not a square on the top of that. Right? So what do we do? Well, our first try is probably to just eh, put a square there and see if, if our problem still is, is solved good enough. But if that's not true, for example, if I want to solve this geometric median problem, which is exactly what I just described to you exactly, then I need a better optimization technique to do that. And in fact, this geometric median problem has lots of interesting properties. One really cool thing that you can check at home, and I won't put this on your homework because it is math and not really CS, is I'll just on the number line. Right? On the number line, this is just the absolute value of this difference between x and xi. Yeah? And you can prove that the optimal point of this, the energy, the thing, the x that minimizes this, is actually the median of the xi's. This is a really surprising fact, by the way, at least to me. And in fact, in general, the geometric median problem only really depends on something like your three closest points. It's very closely connected to del and a triangulation and lots of other problems we care about in graphics. So, okay. Hopefully I've convinced you that, that obviously, and obviously this is just some random sample of problems I thought of the, a couple days ago on the top of my head, but optimization problems show up everywhere, right? And that's why you got this random sample, because they're just, they're just totally reasonable, right? Anytime you write down energy, you want to minimize it. For example, people in physics do this a lot, right? If you have stochastic processes and molecules interacting, maybe you want to find the low energy states. It would be another, another time. In fact, in that case, energy function really means energy, right? Not just like thing measuring stuff that I care about, you know? Um, all of these cases need you to find minima or maxima or settle points or whatever of functions. By the way, when I talk about optimization, I'm going to try and be consistent in this class and only talk about minimization. Obviously, maximizing and minimizing are the same, because you can flip the sign, you know? Uh, but the thing we've got to watch out for are these, uh, these pernicious uh, saddle points, and that's what we're going to talk about a little bit. Cool. So what the heck are we looking for when we solve an optimization problem? Well, I think everybody here could probably define what it means to be a global minimum of a function f. Uh, f. Apologies that the, this r doesn't have the, the, the q double bar on it. Uh, my bad. Uh, but anyway, if I have a function that goes from r into r, notice this is different than the root finding problem. Now we're always going to map into the real numbers. It doesn't make sense to minimize a function that, that gives out two outputs. Yeah? That's like an economics problem. You don't want to like this. Uh, but anyway, uh, if we want to find the global minimum of f, it's nothing more than some point x star, where the f of x star is smaller than all the other f of x's. Yeah? Totally reasonable. I think this is pretty intuitive. And what does it mean to be a local minimum? Well, this might be the, not be the definition you saw in calculus class, but really the most direct way to think about a local minimum of a function is that it's point x star, so that in some neighborhood, epsilon, some little ball around that x star, it's the smallest value. Yeah? That's all a local minimum really is, right? And then we start using our calculus machinery to find other ways to describe local minimum, but this definition works regardless of whether f is convex, continuous, lower, semi-continuous, whatever the heck, fractal, it doesn't matter. Right? A local minimum is just a thing that's smaller than stuff nearby. Reasonable. Cool. So of course, where do you think we're going to go with this? Well, let's say that f is differentiable. Right? We can write down his, uh, his first order approximation, as I have above. Right? And now notice that I've replaced the Jacobian with the gradient of f. By the way, the Jacobian and the gradient are the same thing, just uh, transpose of each other, yeah, which makes sense because they both just have a bunch of derivatives. And what does it mean for me to be at a minimum? Well, I think you guys all know this from, from calculus class, right? When you're at a minimum and you take the first derivative, you just set the thing equal to zero, and, and that's, you know, when that's an equality, then you're, you're good. Yeah, you're golden, at least at a critical point. More generally, let's suppose that, that I take Right, so, so x0 is going to be the center of my Taylor approximation, my first order sort of planar approximation of f. Yeah. And let's say the difference between the x that I'm evaluating f at and x0, the center, is parallel to the gradient of f. Right, so it's equal to alpha times graph f. Then what happens? Well, we can just plug alpha times graph f upstairs there, and in the end, you'll get that along this line, 
f is equal to f by 0 plus alpha times the norm of ground f squared. So what happens when the norm of the gradient of f is non-zero? Well, then if I take alpha to be just a little bit negative, right? Well, we know that that mod grad f squared, that's a positive number, right? This thing here. So the gradient is non-zero, and I move in the minus alpha direction, then I just decrease the function f. So in particular, what do we know is a necessary, not necessarily a condition, but certainly a necessary condition for a differentiable function to be at a minimum? It's that grad f equals zero, right? Because otherwise, I just showed you that there's some direction you can walk in that decreases f a little bit. Yeah? Cool. Right. Um, and in particular, when the norm of that is alpha. Okay, ignore the first tag in the sentence because it makes no sense that I wrote it the whole night. But basically, the sign of alpha is determining whether f is increasing or decreasing. And the norm of grad f is always positive. Uh, oh, I see what I meant to say. Okay, yes, when the norm of grad f is strictly greater than zero, I should put a not equal to zero, it would have been more illustrative here. Then uh, alpha tells you whether f is increasing or decreasing. When normal grad f is equal to zero, then you can't say a whole lot from this first order approximation. There we go. Sorry, you're sloppy instructor once again. Okay, so in particular, this motivates that we should define something called a stationary point of f. It's just a place where it has the zero, uh, where the gradient of f is equal to zero, and this is uh, an indicator that f doesn't change at least in first order. Hopefully, this story is familiar, right? This is not. Uh, this shouldn't be new stuff for you guys. But it's good to review. Okay, so it'll be a typical strategy for minimizing f. Well, we can search for these critical points, and then we can just check if they're local minimum or not, and repeat if we want. In fact, uh, oftentimes we don't repeat, we just stop an optimization and say, well, it's smaller than where you started, so you should be happy. Um, which is uh, unfortunately state of the art in a lot of these times. Okay, so how can we actually check whether we're in a local minimum or maximum? Well, remember how this goes in a single variable calculus, right? I draw a function, right? And uh, here he is, and maybe he goes like that, right? I check that the first derivative is zero, so this is a critical point, and then I look at the second derivative to see whether I'm at a minimum or a maximum, right? In particular, like, the second derivative of this guy is positive, because he kind of looks like a cup, and so we know we're at a local min. If we want to extend this to higher dimensions, we compute this object called the Hessian of x of f. Right? And the Hessian of f is just all of the possible second derivatives I could have taken of f. Right? So row ij is equal to the second derivative of f. The first time I'm going to take it with respect to xi, and the second time with respect to xj. Yeah? Now if we write our Taylor series out for f to two terms, right, you'll see the first two terms up on the top row are the same, and now we can have a third one. Right, so now this is a second order approximation of f, and it turns out that the proper thing to do here is put the Hessian in there. Is this story familiar to you guys? Have you seen this somewhere before? Really? How many of us have seen the word Hessian at least? Somewhere? Heard it? Like, it kind of resonates? Yeah, so, so the Hessian is the matrix of second derivatives, and when, when, we, when we write it down like this, this is the second order approximation of f, and sadly for us, in CS205, I don't have time to keep proving these things to you. So this is, if this doesn't look right to you, uh, you can come talk to me after class, and I'm happy to, to show you what this is. Okay. Well, here's the thing. If we look at the Hessian, just like we, when we looked at the second derivative of f, we can figure out whether our function was cupped upward or downward or so on. Right? In fact, if you examine the structure of the Hessian, you can figure out a similar fact, right? Whether it looks like a hole, a 